Hey everyone, Cody Hayes here, and I'd like to welcome you to part four as we look at the first portion of Christianity. And we left off with, I have it there, Christianities, but uh, I only decided to focus on the form that won, which was Catholic Orthodoxy, that all modern day Christians descend directly or indirectly from. But let us move on to the early church and persecution. Uh, in the early church, the two most prominent leaders were St. Peter and St. Paul, which the icon on top shows. Uh, the Bishop of Rome, whom we commonly refer to as the Pope, is recognized as the successor of St. Peter and St. Paul. Uh, Peter really has the dominance in the Gospel of Matthew, you know, with the statement, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and I will entrust unto you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Uh, Peter, that word, it's the Greek masculine form for the word rock. Um, Paul, in his letter, sometimes refers to Peter as Cephas, which is a transliteration of the Aramic word um, kepha. Aramaic was the language that uh, Jesus and his early followers spoke, including Peter and Paul, but Paul would have been certainly much more educated. Um, Paul is, of course, you know, recognized as, you know, the great letter writer. There are 14 letters in the canonical New Testament that are attributed to Paul. Uh, contemporary historians question Paul being the author of half of them, and one of them, the letter to the Hebrews, has essentially almost been completely removed as a Pauline letter. Um, but Paul has sometimes been looked upon as, you know a second founder, co-founder, even some will say founder of Christianity, and where that is coming from is essentially that Paul took this movement, you know, that was started by Jesus of Nazareth, but took it in a direction that Jesus never could have imagined or perhaps would not have agreed with. Uh, just to maybe add a little bit with that, um, a colleague asked me once, why don't we follow the Jewish Sabbath? And what was meant by that was in Judaism, the Sabbath begins at 5 on Friday and then goes all day Saturday. Whereas in Christianity, it's moved up a day. Why is that? Well, there are arguably two reasons for that. One being the importance of the celebration of the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, and the other being uh, the theology of Paul. Uh, one of the major theological points of Paul was that the death of Jesus did away with the Torah or the law, which not everyone in the early Christian tradition agreed with, but the form that one more or less agreed with Paul. I mean, you still have the use of the Ten Commandments, even though those are just ten of the 613 laws in Judaism, and, you know, there are reasons for why those are still used, which I won't get into the theological reasons there. They would take up more time than necessary, but but, you know, hopefully, you know, you can see the importance of Paul, you know, on that. And I might as well just add that when it comes to Jewish-Christian relations, Jewish people don't have as much problems, you know, with Jesus as they do with Paul. And a major reason why has to do with Paul's attitude regarding the Torah or the law. Well, then moving forward, uh, in the year 64 CE or AD, uh, the city of Rome is destroyed by a fire.
and that's what the other image down below you know has on the screen you know the great fire of rome and uh historians you know vary with what caused the great fire where you know the arguments will go from essentially accidental to intentional Uh, but the Roman Emperor Nero, he places the blame for the fire on Christians and he begins to persecute them. Uh, Nero was not a popular emperor. Uh, there were those going around making the claim that, you know, Nero actually ordered the fire to be set. And in case you're wondering why, it would have been because Nero, he hated the city of Rome. Uh, he loved the city of Naples, and he would have loved to have moved the capital there, but, you know, public opinion would not have let him do so. So the argument is that he wanted to have the city of Rome essentially destroyed so he could then rebuild it in a city of his own liking. And if that was, you know, what he wanted to do, arguably what ended up happening, or excuse me, happening was not anything he could have ever, you know, predicted. So basically he needs to find some type of scapegoat and he uses the Christians as a scapegoat. And the Roman historian and senator Tacitus, you know, talks about this. Um, Tacitus was not a fan of the early Christian movement. He regarded it as a superstition coming out of Judea and that the man who started it, in, that, in this case that would be Jesus, you know, was executed, crucified, you know, by Pontius Pilate when Tiberius was the Roman emperor. But he also mentioned that, you know, a sympathy, a sympathetic nature arose among um, the people of Rome because a lot of them knew they were able to tell that these Christians were being persecuted but that this was being done to basically you know diffuse the situation from a not popular emperor in this case Nero um, in the case, though, with Nero, which is the, the bust that's below, that's of him, uh, Nero, essentially, many historians would argue, is the individual that gets dubbed as the beast in the book of Revelation. Uh, the whole 666 is Gemantria in Hebrew for Nero Caesar, and he was the first Roman emperor to persecute Christians. But there are also other manuscripts of the book of Revelation that have the number at 616, which in Greek is gematria for Caesar God, as many of the Roman emperors saw themselves as living gods. And um, there is a part of me that thinks that maybe the 616 could be the actual, if we found maybe a manuscript of the book of Revelation older than what we currently have, that perhaps that would be the number shown. But you could also argue it the other way too. But, you know, in any case, the persecution of the Christians under Nero, this resulted in the deaths of Saints Peter and Saint Paul. Uh, both of them were executed uh, in Rome. Peter uh, was crucified. The tradition is that he was crucified upside down, although this might be a little bit of early Christian piety, uh, but that he was crucified. That, that is for certain. And he was buried um, in, well, it was a graveyard at the time, but it's currently where um, St. Peter's Basilica is located. Uh, Paul, 
he was also executed, uh, but he, as a Roman citizen, was beheaded. And being beheaded was considered a much more humane punishment because you don't really suffer. Whereas Peter would have really suffered being crucified, although if he was actually crucified upside down, he probably would not have suffered quite as bad as Jesus did. Uh, because how you ultimately die from crucifixion is that your lungs collapse. Peter, if he was crucified upside down, would have more than likely died in his sleep. Um... But, you know, in any case, um, he was certainly crucified now, being crucified upside down. In fact, the upside down cross is traditionally the cross of Peter. But that might be a little bit of Christian piety. But in any case, you know, Peter was definitely crucified and Paul was beheaded, um, both in Rome, um, where Paul was buried um, there's a church there called, you know, St. Paul Outside the Walls in Rome, which is over uh, the tomb of Paul. So look a little bit here at uh, the sacraments. Well, the word sacrament, it means sacred in Latin and mystery in Greek. The use of sacrament is perhaps more coming out of the western side of Christianity, whereas the eastern side would, you know, often refer to them as the mysteries rather than the sacraments. But, you know, some will use the term sacrament, but essentially, you know, we're talking about the same thing here. Uh, in Christianity, there are traditionally seven sacraments. I'll put them up on the screen, but you don't need to write them down, but these are the traditional seven. Baptism, the Eucharist, which in Greek means Thanksgiving, but uh, the Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. Confirmation, penance, or reconciliation, also sometimes commonly called confession. Then marriage, and then uh, the Holy Orders or the priesthood. And traditionally, there are three orders within the um, ordained, you could say, Christian priesthood. And then last, there's the extreme unction, the anointing of the sick, or what is sometimes called the last rites. But of the traditional seven, the two that have stood out the most historically are baptism and the Eucharist. So of the traditional seven Christian sacraments, the two that have stood out the most historically are baptism and the Eucharist. And in the next video, we are going to look a little more in detail of those two sacraments. But we're going to need to stop here. But as I stated just a moment ago, when we come back, we will uh, look more at those two sacraments and perhaps then get into the early church structure. So take care. I will symbolically see you then.